Hello again. It is May the 16th, 2023. Today we will discuss Magritte and reality and surreality and other interesting things. How are you feeling today? I feel excited. I feel wow. excited uh, today. Uh, I felt excited the other day because, uh, well, was it three days ago when we exchanged opinions on uh, these famous paintings we're going to discuss now? Since then, I feel excited. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it was about, I don't know, sometimes last, last week you, you had come across something. No, I think I told you that somebody, no, no, we were writing that story, Drop and Roll, and in the, I don't know if it was in the story or what, but there's this idea that a, a man asks a woman for a picture of her legs. Because, you know, we're, we're living in modern times and people are sending people texts and people are sending each other messages. Yeah, so in the, in the story, um, the man asks the woman for a picture of her, her legs and then the woman is kind of mischievous and funny and just sends a picture of this painting by Magritte. Right. And the upper half is a fish, uh, is a fish and the lower half is a woman. The actual title of the painting is called uh, The Collective Invention, and it was painted by Magritte in 1934. How, how did you feel when you saw that painting? I feel, I felt stunned. I didn't know how to feel. I don't know. I mean, I know how I felt, but when you asked, I cannot explain it. I liked it, and uh, at the same time, I felt some sort of pain subconsciously, and I was scared. <laughs> uh, I didn't know what to do. That's how I, I remember felt. when I sent the, that picture <clears throat> to you, I think it was last week, you said that you had a hard time going to sleep because it was stuck in your mind, and it you found it somewhat disturbing. And uh, I think one of the things about surrealist art, artists is that they really make you stop and take a look at what you think about stuff. Um, this painting, let's just call it the fish woman, the actual title is the collective invention. But um, um, 1934, back in 1929, Andre Breton wrote the Surrealist Manifesto. And in that, 1929, Breton said, the problem of woman is the most wonderful and disturbing problem in the world. What do you think about that quote? I, I would replace the word woman with the word lady, if you don't mind. A fish lady, for instance. Would that be better? Yeah. I don't know why they call it the collective invention. I don't see anything collective in it. Well, right? from the collective uh, unconscious. So, so you know, the surrealists are tapping into the unconscious reality that is very much part of who we are. And if we go back to 1899, Sigmund Freud wrote The Interpretation of Dreams. And at that time, in, I think it was in Vienna, women would come to his studio or his apartment, not apartment, but, you know, his office. And they would lay down on a couch. And he would sit next to them and take notes. He would sometimes smoke a pipe. And they would just talk about what was on their mind. And he just took notes. And some people found that really quite scandalous that wealthy Viennese women would come and lay on a couch and talk to a man who was smoking a pipe. Um, in the work of René Magritte, he's a Belgian artist, he has certain iconic objects that recur. There's the pipe, there's the man in the bowler hat, there's lovers with uh, like a sort of like a, a scarf over their faces. There, There's the fish, fish that appears again and again, the locomotive. So these images come from our unconscious mind. Now, let me just ask you this. Is a dream real? Well, that's a good question with a difficult answer. 
because uh, I am loving all kinds of conspiracy theories. And uh, I cannot, I'm 99% positive that it is real, but there's still 1% that it's not. Would that qualify for an answer? Well, all answers are welcome, and we hope that our subscribers will put some questions and answers and comments below. I uh, want to thank some of our new subscribers. Um, I would say that during the dream time, it's very real. Like I've had dreams where I wake up and I'm startled, and it feels like I'm falling off a tree branch, or maybe I wake up and I hear a voice in the dream. It is very real when the dream is happening. And then when I wake up and go about my day, I kind of talk myself down like, oh, that wasn't so real. Like, that wasn't so bad. You know, I woke up sweating. But I think our rational mind talks to our unconscious mind and tries to tell us that, well, you know, what you're coming up with unconscious is not really real. You're, it, what, you're, you're, you're using the word, you're using the word real. And we're discussing the sure realism. That means probably above reality, well, right? No, sure well, it could be, could, be, could be on, it could be a, a double, you know, the, yeah, on, on, rea it's, it's, it's like metaphysics, beyond physics. Sure reality is on reality. So it, if you think about it, um, you know, different things happen in our life that disturb us and we can't actually find answers to like what was the what's the pandemic all about or like can i touch my face i'm like why did my best friends get a divorce and like you know why why do children grow up and move away there's there's so many questions that we have that you can't figure out during waking hours so sometimes you'll have a or I'll, I'll have a dream and my unconscious mind is kind of working on it kind of chewing on it and trying to come up you know, with, with an answer. I mean, I had this one dream about trying to save this little girl that was going to jump out a window. Now, uh, was it real during the time? Yeah, very real. But what did it really mean? That you know, that's open to interpretation. So that's kind of what we're doing here in Patroma therapy, just kind of bouncing around some ideas. Um, Speaking and, of ideas, can 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 you can I ask you a question? So if if you were Rene Magritte and you were asked to produce a painting, paint the painting, uh, just as similar to the collective invention, would you replace the uh, below waist part with man's leg and all everything above the waist is with them? Um, I don't know, with an elephant or with a lion? Well, you know, uh, what what we have here in the original one by Magritte is the legs of a woman, the upper part is a fish, which is an inverse mermaid. Generally, mermaids are kind of sort of shape shifters. Uh, they appear in a lot of art and music and mythology. So the traditional mermaid is upper part is a woman, you know, pretty hair, boobs, arms, and the lower part is a fish. And in the story of Odysseus, you know, he gets he gets uh, enchanted by these sirens and they're calling to him. And, and you know, it, you know, women are, women are very dangerous and very destructive to, to men. And as you're asking, like, well, what do I think about we, we, we reverse that? Well, you know, I think the whole, uh, you know, opposite sex whole thing, you know, it's kind of mysterious. And like, you know, we sort of know what to do above the table. You know, we talk, we drink coffee, we make small talk, we flirt. But, you know, whatever various passions, you know, lurk below, you know, people are never really sure. Should they act on their passions? Should they ask act on their instincts? Should they flirt with the shop girl, you know, we, when we think about, you know, you said, well, well, what if, what if it was like a, like I'm a woman and what, what if I painted something like that, that would be like the upper part would be, a, would be like maybe a bull. Well, I don't know, a year or two ago, we did 
an episode here on Patroma Therapy about Daedalus and Icarus, who built the labyrinth, and there was a minotaur in it. And the minotaur is exactly that. The yes, I was, I was going to... I was going to say the same thing. Yeah, go, yeah, go, go. Tell us about the Minotaur. Uh, I don't, I don't know what to tell, uh, <laughs> except that I imagine the Minotaur lying just next to the fish lady. Uh, oh my but gosh. that would be a murder. Yeah, I don't want to <laughs> go into that. But then again, I, I think, what if, uh, what if I'm asked to add uh, another object beyond? The fish or in the sea, what would I okay. add to, to make it more surreal? No, wait a second, wait a second, like? wait a minute. Okay, whatever you say, I don't want to talk about that. In Freudian psychology, when they let's say that I'm a therapist and you're coming in for therapy, and you say, I don't want to talk about that, that's the very thing we need to explore. You want the Minotaur to be with the fish woman. Yeah, that I is, think that, that made a nice scary. Term. That, that would be quite. It's not. Quite a, it's it's no, completely quite, natural. Because, no, I'm saying that would be quite a couple. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I think that would look. They would look great. But but uh, <laughs> if it wasn't Minotaur, uh, what would it be? What else could it be? I'm thinking. Well, it could be any kind of beast. Could could be any kind of beast. I mean, I just like we have the story, the Disney story, Beauty and the Beast, and and. I just want to briefly go back to the Minotaur who was who's stuck in this labyrinth. And do you know how he became a Minotaur according to the Greek stories? How did he become a Minotaur? These are Greek myths. Yeah, well, I my my memory is a little hazy, but I think there was a perversion sort of in him becoming a minotaur right could you could you could you enlighten me please because is it did you say I'm inversion sure. or perversion the second one perversion okay mm -hmm. <laughs> so you are in therapy i have no words okay. yeah i'd like to hear it but i'm unable to say it out loud myself okay so there was this king who a real king who lived on the island of crete now Crete and Italy and the Aegean coast of Turkey and all that area is like fabulous sunshine and rocks and everyone's eating fruit and drinking and everyone feels, you just feel like so alive all the time. So it's no wonder all this is taking place there. So this king of Crete, his name was Minos, King Minos. And he got into an argument with one of his brothers because sometimes brothers argue and King Minos had a wife named Pasephae, Pasephae. And um, so his, his brother, uh, or maybe it was Poseidon, the god of the sea, got mad at him and said, okay, well, you know, just to make, I'm going to fix it for you. I'm going to make your wife fall in love with a real bull. And the parents of the Minotaur are this Cretan bull and Pasephae. So Pasephae was the wife of King Minos. And, you know, sometimes women feel like maybe their husbands are not doing an adequate job in the bedroom. So sometimes they kind of look around for other guys that are, you know, shopping in the mall. So some of these stories, the Greek myths are based on the archetypes and our own human urges. So how did this happen? Okay, yes. so we have this. King Minos of Crete and his beautiful wife, who now is someone put a spell on her, and now she has to have sex with this bull. So what um, they get Daedalus, who built the labyrinth, they go, you're pretty good at building stuff. Why don't you build us a like a wooden, like a wooden cow? And let's put the wife in the cow, the wooden, the wooden, you know, creature. Yeah, and but let's see. The, that was a horse. No, it wasn't a horse. It's a cow. He's a, 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 the bull is going to mate with a a, a cow, not a horse. Oh, okay, maybe it's just me. Go on. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. The, 
Well, it's, you know, it's a beast, bestial creature. But anyhow, so this Crete, this is the myth, the Cretan bull. And, you know, Pasiphae has been enchanted in some way or had a spell put on her. And she crawls into this hollowed out wooden cow and somehow mates with a real cow. And they have a little baby. And that's a, that's the baby Manitar. And so now they have this unnatural baby. Because that's what happens when you have sex outside of marriage. Have you ever thought about that? Uh, I I thought about uh, uh, something else while you were uh, <laughs> you know reciting <laughs> this substance. I I thought that what if it were you uh, in front of in in front of Sigmund Freud, Mr. Freud, Herr Freud, and uh, he, he, what would he said about that if it was a dream, your dream? He would he say would it's have probably it, killed it, himself. He would say it's repressed sexual desire. So like I'm a lady laying on his couch, 1899, and I'm talking about this dream I had, and he's smoking his pipe and taking notes, and he's making money out of just listening to women talk about their dreams and their fantasies. So Freud would say, you know, we have the id, our instinctual part of our personality. We have the super ego, which is the rules of society. No, you cannot have sex with everyone you want. No, you cannot eat everything. You have to share, you have to have manners. So the, yes. the rules of society and then the pressure of the id is mediated through ego development. So that's like kind of what civilization is. Like we, we have to learn how to be civil because basically we're just, otherwise we're just, you know, completely out of control. So Freud would probably say that this is a normal, frustrated Viennese woman who has she is sexually frustrated yes yes he would say that not to change the subject but can we <laughs> maybe you know discuss one more switch to more wholesome paintings of Rene Magritte which is called yeah. in the room I, I don't know what, who comes up with these names I mean they're completely yeah. out of touch with the paintings Wait a minute. just a minute excuse me the artist creates his own title, just like the pianist creates his own uh, piano composition title, just like the author creates his own title. You, you know. mean that was, that was him? Who, yes, who the poet, the Magritte comes up with all his own titles, just like, you know, Dostoevsky came up with his titles and Tolstoy and Proust and everybody comes up with their titles. So the titles are, don't come after the titles are named by the actual creator so let's suppose you're going to let's suppose you know how to play the piano and you want to you know write something about springtime and you're you know stravinsky you say oh i'm going to call this the right of spring so you can call it whatever you want so these titles come from the creator of the work of art i mean th this this next one that you want to talk about is also very unusual and very disturbing because it's a very large green apple in a room and it's filling up the whole room. So in the in realism, the apple is about as big as your fist, right? And you're sitting at a table looking out the window. So that's realism. But surrealism, somehow this painting that you you were concerned with is a huge apple. So what do you think's going on there? Well, when I look at these paintings, usually I'm indifferent to any paintings in front of me, however famous it is. But this, they they spoke to me. They really spoke to me. When I look at this apple, I I'm thinking of huge meteorites, which I see in my dreams every time I have high fever, like really really high, like borderline. Uh, I don't know. What word can I use? So these meteorites, out of proportion, surrounds me from each and every side. And this apple, when I see this painting in this small room, the huge apple, is exact representation of what yes. my feelings 
so let me well, let me ask you know, this. So I like it. The the paradox is that I like it and I hate it at the same time. It's like sadomasochism. I don't want to yes, talk about it. I don't want to think about it. But still, I'm attracted to it. I look. I open the picture. I look at this, and I I keep looking. I keep finding it. For crying out loud, I don't know why. How does so that? Let me ask you this sense? about. Let me ask you about the the dream of the meteorites. Is this something that happened as an adolescent, or it's continued as an adult, or you had it three weeks ago? The the meteorites raining down on you. How how recurring and how often have you had that dream of the meteorites? Well, the high fever I mentioned. Luckily, I I'm not having it very often. Like maybe once in in a decade, in ten years. Uh, but but okay, the first but one, still... I remember that distinctly when I was five or six years old, this meteorized first uh, manifested themselves. Uh, and so, I still remember it as though it was yesterday. Well, so probably what a, a, a trained therapist, like you and I are just amateurs, uh, a trained therapist would say that some traumatic event, trauma is just something that shakes you. Something happened to you as a little boy around five or six years old, and the and we don't have to go into too much detail, but I'm saying something happened back at that time, and it was manifest through these huge meteorites, and it occurs every now and then when you feel that same psychological pressure going on in your life. So, I mean, I've been a teacher my whole life, so one of my recurring themes of my dreams or my unconscious life is, you know, I've got my class roster, I've got my lecture prepared, and I can't find the room. I can't find the room. I'm going down a hall. I can't find the room. I'm looking for 126. I'm looking for 126. And it's, it's a, uh, you know, even I haven't been in a, in a classroom in Houston for a while, I still have that dream. And I even have had it even before, uh, you know, I became a, a professional teacher. Now, now let me ask you, is there any painting in the world that evokes that kind of memory, that brings them back, um, that kind of yes, dream yes, you had, yes, that kind yes, of horror? Yes, yes. And if there, what is it? Okay, well, the, the surrealists that m most people know, they know Salvador Dali, his famous painting, 1931, The Persistence of Memory. It's kind of the drooping clocks. People also know Marcel Proust, French novelist, A la Recherche du Temps Perdu, seven volumes, published in 1913, In Search of Lost Time. So the, the themes of time and memory are, they just keep coming up again and again. And, and, and the persistence of memory, that's the name of Salvador Dali's painting of the kind of, you know, sort of melted, melted clocks. But, if, you know, even if we go back as far as some of the other changes or shapeshifters, you know, Ovid was a Roman poet and he wrote 250 myths Roman myths about changes in, you know, uh, Narcissus is being, you know, a man is changed into, you know, a daffodil, a woman is changed into a laurel tree, you know, so Ovid has his metamorphosis, <clears throat> and then uh, Kafka is, is German, you know, the metamorphosis by Kafka starts off like this. Gregor Samsa woke one night from disturbing dreams to find that he had been turned into a giant cockroach. So that's Kafka's metamorphosis. Yeah, I found I found uh, the picture you just referenced to uh, the persistence of memory. I mean, apparently the Salvador Dali was uh, from Spain because the original name title is in Catal Catalan. Catalan, I think it's Spanish. La persistencia de la memoria. I think that's how mm -hmm. it sounds. Yeah, but speaking of uh, that apple, that listening room, actually, the uh, René Marit was Belgian, and his titles initially was in French. C could you could you read uh, how the original runs? 
some some in the original title in French. Do, if you have any like a smartphone in your hand, could you please well, do I that? Don't, listen I don't in the room and I don't see. have I don't have them. I mean, yeah. I know okay. Marce That's I know no Marcel. No, I mean, I know Marcel's Alors Cherche de Tom Perdue because I originally read it in French. But like these these works of art by Magritte, I actually saw in person in Houston, Texas, at the Manel Collection. So oh. Magritte is somebody that I was fortunate to be able to just walk into a museum and see uh, this half fish woman, and and I've seen another painting that's called the lovers it's it's two people kissing painted in 1928 and they have like a scarf over their head and both of them have a have like they're wearing kind of like a, a scarf tied around their head and i just know that um this art collection to be able to see art in person is so much different from looking at it in a book or looking at it online or googling it and when i first saw the magritte's in person the room was painted kind of a dark slate gray with some recessed lighting. And then on each wall was, just imagine you, you know, Houston, Texas is, is like hot and humid. You go inside, it's air conditioned, you go down a, a hallway into a room. There's a guard standing in next to the room because none of this is behind glass. It's all accessible to the public. And the walls were painted kind of a, gray slate color and you're just standing in front of the listening room which is that huge apple i mean it is so powerful like you i literally was gasping like oh my god what is, what is that you're like what is that and i've taken students to there there it, to see art in person is really uh it, it it's really quite powerful because probably the item you're seeing is produced 100 years ago. When was it? I think in 1930s or 40s. And you imagine that Rene Magritte standing and painting the picture in front of it, and now you're seeing yes. it. You're, you're yes. seeing it just as, uh, at the same distance as he saw it uh, when he was painting it. Hey, I, I found the Overs translation, How I mean the title in French. I hope I, I don't know a word of French, but I hope I'm not killing it. Two words, just check me if if I'm wrong. Tell me, or correct me if I'm wrong. Les am amants, les amants. Les amants. Les amants. Les amants. Les amants. Oh. Put, okay. like, yeah. les amants. Yeah. Well, you know, ah. it, it is a very intriguing and disturbing image because um, if you think about like there's so many different versions of the kiss, you know, there, there's, I mean, there's so many versions of just the theme of the kiss, but this is some kind of a lovers. So they're supposed to be intimately together, but somehow they're not together. And like, they can't even see each other. And now, now, uh, yeah, no, no, no. I, uh, takes me back two years in time, takes me back in time when we were all wearing masks because that was uh, mandatory during COVID times. And uh, I don't know, some people probably um, kissed each other, you know, while wearing it. So very much um, the same, only they could, you know, see what they're doing. Uh, I don't know, I, also, I, came... I, I, mean, I came across, I... go ahead, go ahead. When I look at these paintings, I makes me think of two dead people kissing, probably because many, yes. many centuries ago, they wrap people up in this, you know, white sheets, and and uh, before oh, they yes. have it, and, uh, that that looks the same on this. Yes, the it's, it, yeah, it's very, it's it's very, it evokes a lot. Um, I happened to come across an article, uh, <laughs> just very recently, talking about it was it came out of the New York Times about how during during uh, you know the pandemic. A lot of these uh, online sex uh, shops were selling a lot of, you know, ma masks and, you know, crazy, crazy stuff, you know, related to, you know, sort of being trapped. But I, I know that in um, the story that we recently wrote, uh, Drop and Roll, there's a part of it 
where these two people are kind of together, but she, so she, this, that part I wrote, it's about a woman just sort of laying there and the guy's with her and she's not like, she's physically there, her body's there, but her mind is someplace else. So you can be with somebody physically, but your mind's someplace else. And in that story, drop and roll, there's just a couple parts above her body. She hovered whenever they were together, she left him again and again. So it, it's not really about her leaving the house. It's just like, well, they're together, you know, they're kind of in bed or whatever, but she, her body's there, but she's not. And her mind's just thinking of other stuff, you know, peacocks and alligators. And then the guy says, look at me. And then in the story, I wrote blankly, she stared into his eyes. So where was she? Is she the body that's with the guy in bed or is she the disassociated spirit or personality? No, that made me think that um, like, welcome to my world because of when I <laughs> am with someone, I'm like, I, I, cup, I cup, in reverse, uh, my, I feel like my mind is here, but my body is uh, something somewhere far, far away. Um, I don't know. You yeah, kind of so, saw. Sorry. No, I was going to say yeah. So that, that this I think is part of the idea of surrealism. Like our body can be here, but our mind can be someplace else, or our mind can be here, but our body is someplace else, or we're disassociated from our body. You know, some people. Obviously, you know, you're drinking a cup of coffee. You feel the coffee cup warm in your hand, but you know, some yeah, people. Yeah, that that go, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, I just also, like, when I see it, um, when I look at paintings, uh, Rene Madrid of Lovers, uh, I'm thinking, is it possible to kiss, you know, with a piece of white cloth, or with the head wrapped in a piece of white cloth at all? Like, if I suggest that to somebody, would I be considered, like, a pervert or... or six, well, six, if it was six, a, if you were invited to a sex party, you would probably... That would probably be expected. I don't know. I mean, oh, there's but, all but kinds I, of... Therapy. But I'm never invited. Uh, okay, well, you know, that's why you're in therapy. We're going to try to get you some invitation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Send me an invite. <laughs> yeah, for, for a good time, please call Patroma Therapy and leave a <laughs> message on our, our message and board. Well, exactly. <laughs> One of the exercises will um, we'll be kissing each other, kissing your partner with the <laughs> white cloth. <laughs> around your head uh, oh. obstacle through an obstacle right to increase your well pain. through it's it's through well you know it's it's not um i mean it's sort of a kiss sort of i don't know i mean it's it's just it's just kind of just just is is what it is but well, uh, uh yeah, there's well i feel like we're kind of kind of coming to an end here and uh we enjoyed talking, at least I did, and uh, thank our subscribers for subscribing. And I'm just going to ring the bell and say adios for now. Thank you. I enjoyed that. <laughs>